I can commence the recording. All right. Good evening and happy February to everyone here at the uh, meeting of the Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee meet, uh, for Community District 2. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We have a pretty big agenda. There's a few things that I have to go through first per standard protocol for these meetings. Uh, I, I'd like you to know that the meeting that we're attending today is being recorded uh, for the purpose of transparency and for permanent public access on the CB2 YouTube archive. All attendees should keep your microphone muted when not in operation. Uh, that way we don't have feedback and, and, and such. Um, and district staff will actively assist in maintaining this protocol. It, it's the practice of Community Board 2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members' cameras on for full transparency. We encourage all attendees attendees to also leave their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. To maintain appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and the general public. If you wish to speak, please use the WebEx feature in the participant panel to digitally raise and lower a hand, and I will call on you in order. If you have questions that fall outside of public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel. We will address them if relevant to, this, to the matter and as time permits. If any attendee experiences technical difficulties with the WebEx software or features during the meeting, please consult help.webex.com. After the meeting, please reach out to the district office at bk02.cb.nyc. Gov. It is our desire to provide access for all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. If you require any accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district staff office 72 hours before any public meeting. Um, we are now going to begin a brief roll call and introduction of the committee members here. Um, I know it does not appear that we have a quorum at this time, but we are, I believe, one person short. So hopefully we can get started and we can definitely do the initial presentations uh, before we do that. But first, let's briefly introduce ourselves from the committee. I'm Brandon Smith. I'm the chair of, of the Health, Environment, Social Services Committee. Jessica? I'm Jessica Thurston, secretary of the committee. Sure thing. Um, Carol Ann? Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Carol Anchich, Assistant District Manager, CB2. Great. Um, Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. Oh, it kept moving. I'll start all over again. Good evening. I'm Nicole McKnight, and I am a committee member. Great, thank you, Nicole. Uh, Barry, would you like to introduce yourself? Barry Newmark, public member, and good evening, everybody. Excellent. Um, I believe that is everybody who's on the committee. I want to also recognize a couple members of the board who are here tonight, or at least one member of the board. Latrell, do you want to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. My name is Latrell Marceau, and I'm a um, board member. Thank you. Excellent. And I believe we have just achieved quorum. We have Mr. Andrews on the line. And I'll just make a quick note about Mr. Andrews. Unfortunately, his audio will not be able to work tonight. So he's going to let me know how he plans to uh, to vote on things um, offline. And I'll, I'll record that as it's going. But um, before we officially launch into the meeting and the presentation, there are just a couple of things that I want to note, uh, just in terms of meeting protocol and how we can have probably the most successful meeting. So you may remember from the past few meetings that I've been trying to stress, and I'll stress again this evening, that um, those of us who are here not making a presentation tonight on the agenda, which accounts for most of us, both us board members and those of you who are members of the public, I would just encourage you all to try to keep your comments brief and to the point. We have a section for uh, the public at the end of the meeting called community forum. We have a section for board members uh, called any other business. And if you have a, a nice, beautiful, loquacious statement 
that you'd like to make at that point, it would be wonderful to hear it. Um, at, in the meantime, we're going to try to keep the meeting going with, with all the things that we have on the agenda. And uh, aside from the presenters who we really like to hear from, it'd be great if you could try to keep your comments kind of short and to the point, be conscious of the space you're taking up. Aside from that, I want to also encourage everybody to try to be, and I'm sorry if this runs a little counter, but we do have some folks who attend our meetings who have uh, uh, who have challenges, disabilities, and, and not all of their, uh, the faculties that the rest of us have. And because of that, I, I just want to encourage everyone to try to speak as slowly and uh, distinctly as possible and uh, try to describe things that are being presented. Because I And I'll certainly try to do that myself. Um, so with that in mind, I, I'd like to kick it off and ask if we have an approval of tonight's agenda. Can I get a motion from any members of the committee? Motion. Welcome from Ms. McKnight. Any second? Second. Second, Mr. Newmark. All right. Um, I'm in favor. Awesome. Mr. Newmark, are you in, you in favor? Yes, I'm in favor. McKnight, you in favor? Yes, I am. Ms. Thurston, you've indicated you're in favor. Um, Mr. <laughs> Andrews, if, if you can let me know, then th that will be great. I, I think either way we, we can consider tonight's agenda approved. Um, we are very lucky and thankful to have here tonight uh, a couple of presenters who are from, on the one hand, NYU Langone Brooklyn Vaccine Center, as well as uh, NYC Health and Hospitals Test and Trace Corp. Um, it would be really great if uh, you could introduce yourselves here. And I understand that it, it may be a joint presentation, but I think we're happy to, to go with how you're going to present this. Um, and we're very excited to hear the information about the vaccine that you're going to be talking about tonight. So uh, who do we have and who's going to be taking the lead first? Uh, so Laura Atlas here from New York City Test and Trace Corps. Thank you so much for having me. I have sort of our stock standard presentation. Um, I haven't coordinated directly with NYU on it, but uh, if they're willing, then we can go through it. There's certainly vaccine information as it pertains to sort of the entirety of the city. Um, and so if if they are amenable, I'm happy to go forward with that and then we can uh, do a tag team at the end. Let me know if that works for everybody. It sounds okay to, to me. Is that okay for our our uh, presenters from NYU Langone? This is Kelly Minus from the NYU Brooklyn Vaccine Center. Uh, yes, we're going to speak specifically about vaccine trials and not just the current vaccines that are available. Great. Okay. All right. So why, okay. don't, why don't we kick it off? And thank you all very much. Thank you all. Um, and thank you for your note about speaking more slowly and clearly. I tend to be a very fast talker, so <laughs> a good reminder. All right, um, so this is where we are as a city, just to sort of uh, contextualize everything. Um, so just so folks uh, know what they're looking at, this is a heat map on the left of the entire city. The more blush the map is, the higher the positivity rate. And then next to it, you will see the epi curve, which shows our seven day rolling average going all the way back to March of last year. Now, a couple of notes about this uh, graph and same thing on this page is roughly showing you the same thing is one. If folks remember back to the early days of the pandemic, we did not have the testing capacity that we currently have. So if you think about it in that uh, in that context, you can imagine how high our positivity rate likely was, uh, but based on the amount of testing that we had in March and April, this was the number of cases and positivity rate that we were seeing. Now we obviously have an extraordinary amount of testing. In fact, we have the ability to test well over 100,000 people on a given day in New York City, and many days we exceed that number. Um, in fact, I think last week or two weeks ago, we actually had multiple days of people uh, seeking tests at a rate of 100,000 or more, which is really great news for us. <clears throat> and so what you see as the map goes more toward the right, the epi curve, 
is we had that really low, amazing period in the summer when our positivity rate, I don't even think was at 1%. Um, it has spiked up. The thing that I would, I really like to draw people's attention to on the curve is every time we go through a big holiday, one specifically that uh, usually involves lots of indoor gathering, we immediately see that percent positivity spike up. So you can see kind of right around where the Christmas Hanukkah season is. You can see right around New Year's. And what you'll see going into February is that we've actually had a decline. We haven't had a decline because, you know, of anything other than that, we stopped uh, having the big gatherings that I think many people were having for New Year's and all of the other holidays. And, you know, we went back to the basics, wearing masks, washing hands, socially distancing, avoiding crowds. Every time we get, um, we lean more into those, what we call the core four, we see the rate immediately starts to go down. This isn't that testing has gone down. It's not that, you know, there's uh, some mutation that's weaker. This is about kind of our behavior and how, um, how it reflects in the positivity rate. And then the last note I would make is that all the way to the right, you'll see a gray bar that represents the week we're currently in. And so the reason it looks like it's dipping down even more radically is not necessarily because it is, but most likely just because the week of data hasn't been um, backfilled yet or completed. Um, so this is also sort of our standard way of checking ourselves, checking the city to see where we are. We have milestones. Obviously, we want to see all of them decreasing, <clears throat> while certainly stable is better than increasing. I think the important thing is that we're stabilizing at a pretty high number right now. We wanna keep suppressing that number. We wanna keep breaking chains of transmission. Um, so this is Brooklyn. This is where uh, Brooklyn is sort of as an entire borough. You can see your own epi curve and you can also see where you compare to the city. Uh, so a little bit higher than the citywide average, um, but not sort of excessively over it. Uh, in terms of the new UK variant, um, you know, we have seen cases uh, throughout the city, throughout the state, and throughout the country now of the variant. I think the most important thing when we're talking about the variant is that the more opportunity that there is for the virus to spread, the more opportunity there is for it to mutate. So not only is it important to wear your mask and avoid the indoor gathering and wash your hands and socially distance for all of the reasons that we sort of are familiar with from the last 11 months, we have yet another reason to do all of those things, which is not to give the virus more opportunities to mutate. Um, so moving on, of course, the things that I've just named are the things we need to all continue to do uh, in order to break chains of transmission or to stop transmission in total. We also have a commissioner's advisory that's been out for a few months advising uh, New Yorkers with underlying health conditions and older New Yorkers to stay home whenever possible. Um, I know that this is a particularly challenging one, but, you know, we want to continue to be mindful that there is community spread and there is still risk associated with outdoor activities. Moving on to vaccines, which I think is the light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, this is from our tracker, which is available online now. What it will tell you is a few different things that are important. Um, obviously, how many people receive their first dose? I think the most exciting thing to report on this is that New York City at this point is very good at distributing doses as they come in. I think we have the reverse issue right now, which is that we have so many more people who are eligible than we have supply. And that kind of continues to be um, the challenge that we're facing now. And it's not that different than the challenges we've faced in other iterations of the virus. So people remember back to April, March, if you wanted a test for COVID, you had to go to one of a very few set of countries and you had to have very specific symptoms. Um, it was really, really challenging to get a test. We have come a long way. Um, anybody who wants or needs a test now is able to receive one um, fairly easily. So I think vaccines are going to fit into a similar pattern, unfortunately. Um, but so we put this up to keep us to keep us honest so that everybody can see kind of <clears throat> the actual trajectory of distribution. So over um, half a million people, well over half a million people, almost three quarters of a million have received the first dose. The first dose is great. Of course, the vaccine is a multi-shot uh, vaccination. 
And so the number we really are paying attention to is that second dose number. So that's going to start to come up as the folks who were brought into eligibility in what they call 1B are beginning to get their second doses. Remember, in the beginning, we could only vaccinate a very small section of the population. And so as those 1B folks begin to become eligible for the second dose, you're going to see this jump. Now, the other thing is people look at that 1.3 million number and they say, this doesn't make any sense. Why haven't more been distributed if they're here? We are required to hold back a reserve of second shots. This is something that I actually think uh, it, people can look at it as being um, a barrier, but I actually think it brings a lot of comfort to people. I know we've heard a lot that folks are concerned that if they get their first shot, there's not going to be a second shot or you know, they're going to have to wait months and months and months. And at that point, it's going to mess with the kind of sequencing. So what I would say to you is have no fear on the second dose front. We have quite a comfortable reserve of second doses at this point. Moving on, we've also published the data about vaccinations by race and ethnicity and age group. Um, <clears throat> I will say for race and ethnicity, these are self-identified. So there are many people who don't feel comfortable disclosing. And so we also have that accounted for. But, you know, we wanted to make sure that the information that we had was being sort of seen by everybody um, in the same way that we see it. On that note, I've touched on this a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. But just to go back, phase distribution. So phase distribution is what we're in right now, right? The vaccine is not open to the public at this point. It's open to very specific groups of folks who have been determined by the CDC and the state. Um, those categories do open every so often. So yesterday, the state announced that they were going to be adding uh, restaurant workers and um, uh, TLC licensees as well. So that means that anybody who fits in those criteria is able to, if they can get an appointment, receive a vaccine in New York City. Um, in terms of the second dose, there are two standards for each of the different uh, varieties. I would say that People, I think, like um, are very attentive to the exact number of days between their first and second dose. There is a little bit of variety there, and so we can be a little bit more flexible. I also think important to say, <clears throat> and NYU can talk about this more, I think, is that the first and the second dose effectively are the same thing. They're two boosters. So after your first dose, you're something like 50, 54% able to protect yourself against, uh, you know, exposure to the infection or the infection itself. And then after the second dose, you are 90, 92, 95% more able to fight it off. I should also say, I think people have a lot of confusion about kind of how the vaccine actually works, in part because it's new to the general public. Important to say it is not new to people who develop vaccines. They've been thinking about messenger RNA vaccine for a long time. and so. The way that this works, it's not a live vaccine. Nobody is getting injected with the coronavirus right now. It is essentially a vaccine that teaches your body what the virus looks like and how to identify it and, um, you know, attack it. So that, uh, I think, for me, gives me lots of comfort. And when I tell people that, I think they seem to find it uh, in a more palatable approach to vaccination. <laughs> Um, in terms of how to make an appointment, you can go on the vaccine finder to see all types of distribution near you. Um, so this isn't just city sites. There are other private sites listed there as well. You can make appointments through the uh, portal. You can also call 877-VAX-FOR-NYC. Now I'm giving you all these options and I know that you're going to tell me uh, I tried to call or I tried to go online and there's never any appointments. I think, unfortunately, this is just where we are in terms of supply. We have a really challenging supply, uh, an unpredictable supply line right now. So <clears throat> as we're able to really um, have a supply line that's more reliable, I think a lot of these problems are going to dissipate and we're going to be in a world where not just New York City, but also more pharmacies, more providers have the ability to really give out these uh, appointments and give people vaccines as they want them. And then finally, people ask all the time how they can help. There's a few different ways, obviously, continuing to practice these core four that I've been talking about. 
And then um, we have fact sheets, we have uh, social media kits. If people get vaccinated, one of the things we've found is that the more people get vaccinated, the more other people feel comfortable getting vaccinated. So share your story, you know, um, talk to your community about it, talk to your neighbors about it, tweet about it, put it up on Facebook, put it in your WhatsApp group. Um, really trying to just sort of build comfort around uh, the, the kind of embrace of the vaccine, if you will. On that note, I'm going to hand it over to NYU. So Kim, can you start the slideshow? In the meantime, I'm Kelly Minus, a nurse practitioner at the NYU Brooklyn Vaccine Center. Akeem Moore is the project manager, and we have the lead investigators of the Brooklyn site, Dr. Sterling and Dr. Parmesh Warren. I'm going to go relatively quickly over the first slides as Laura so adequately described COVID and our first slide is actually the second slide. Next slide. Uh, our second slide is actually Laura's slide. So she uh, so capably described it. I'm going to skip to the next slide. And this is just going to be a quick overview. We all know the signs and symptoms of COVID illness, the fever, the cough, and the difficulty breathing, as well as the less common chills, body aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and the loss of taste and smell. And as Laura said, between two and day, 14 days after exposure is when you begin to see these symptoms. Next slide. Again, Laura covered this part. How is it spread? We know through droplets and that's why we're wearing the mask and continuing on the social distancing and the droplets are less transmissible than we first thought in terms of surface to person transmission, but still plausible. So we continue to maintain uh, distance in workplaces and continue to wipe down surfaces. Next slide. So more specifically, what are the social and structural factors impacting COVID-19? Uh, we all know that people of cover, color are overrepresented in essential services and industries with increased exposure in terms of your healthcare providers, your food workers, and so they were disproportionately affected by both the impact of COVID-19 and the infection rates of COVID-19. The older population often has waning immunity and live in congregate care settings like nursing homes. So they have the double exposure of living in the congregate care sites and being exposed to the workers who work in those sites who are often people of color. People with low wage jobs in the beginning, we saw this a lot with no sick time, did not take time off. And so they came to work ill. And so they ran the chance of infecting other people unwittingly at first before the masks were put into place. And residential segregation, not just nursing homes or congregate care settings, but multi-generational housing is thought to have played a large part in black and brown people's higher rates of transmission. Next slide, please. So what could a, a COVID SARS vaccine do individually? And it's not just the prevention of illness that you hear these vaccines are 95 and 90% and then one they say is 70%. It's in the reduction of sev illness severity. So even in, for instance, the AstraZeneca trial that first came out at 70% reduction of COVID-19, it was 100% effective at preventing hospitalizations and uh, over 95% effective in, pre in preventing severe and moderate uh, COVID infection. So we've all had a flu-like infection and we can get over it. We just don't want to die from a flu-like infection. And the benefits to the community is the reduction of transmission all around, healthier communities, and eventually uh, estimated that 70% will get a herd immunity and reduce the national impact of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So how does the vaccine work? They introduce a 
portion of a SARS COVID virus and it causes the body to jump to a response and fighter cells go into action and create antibodies to that vaccine. Next slide, please. As Laura said, you cannot get COVID-19 from any of the vaccines that are going available or going to become available. As this slide shows you, if you have a bicycle and a handlebar and a chain, a bicycle wheel, you cannot create a whole bicycle out of that. You can't take a piece of something and make an entire virus. So what you hear about are side effects of antibody production and not COVID infection that people get post-vaccination. Next slide, please. So what does it mean for a vaccine to be effective? Uh, people who are old enough can remember when diphtheria was a real illness and many people were aff afflicted with polio. And for all intents and purposes in first world countries, those diseases have been eradicated. And measles we find has ha has also been nearly eradicated, but in unvaccinated communities, not just individuals in unvaccinated communities where there's no longer herd immunity, we saw a recent resurgence in measles vaccine, but it's relatively small uh, in relation to the population as a whole. Next slide, please. So our mission is to protect and restore human health through innovative research and community is essential in this. So as previously stated, black and brown people are disproportionately affected as well as older people. And if these communities are not adequately represented in vaccine trials, we run the risk that the vaccines that are produced will be left less efficacious in these populations than they are in the general public as a whole. Next slide, please. So we at the Brooklyn Vaccine Center uh, started NYU Manhattan got a federal grant from the National Institute of Health to start a VTEU, which stands for Vaccine Treatment and Evaluation Unit. And early on in COVID, we saw that it, the disproportionately affected people. And so we reached out into the Brooklyn community. Uh, NYU Brooklyn is in the Sunset Park community and has some presence in the East Flatbush community and Borough Park community, which are significant communities of various colors. And so we opened five sites in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Long Island in order to test possible vaccines for this pa current pandemic. Next slide, please. Well, we're located, as I said, in the Sunset Park area, but anybody interested in joining a vaccine trial, it's not limited to residents of that uh, Sunset area. Next slide, please. Early on, this was our core uh, employees of the Brooklyn Vaccine and Treatment Center. Next slide, please. So it's very important to remember that having vaccines available do not save lives. Vaccines do. And education and trust is the key, especially considering the large amount of vaccine hesitancy that we've encountered in certain communities. Next slide, please. So far, there are two vaccines approved for, by the FDA, Pfizer and Moderna, and both are M mRNA vaccines. As Laura said, they're new technology to the general public, but the scientific community has been working quite some time on developing mRNA vaccines and have been using mRNA in other, other aspects of healthcare for quite some time. And a lot of mistrust has been around the knowledge or the lack of knowledge regarding the mRNA. And they're afraid it's going to cause be permanent residence in their body. But the mRNA is like everything else of the body. After it produces an antibody, it breaks that protein down. It recycles. The body is the ultimate recycler. It recycles what it needs and what it doesn't, what it can't use, it discards in the regular waste excretion process. Next slide, please. Okay, these numbers were as of December 2020. Uh, Pfizer vaccine enrolled 45,000 people. 
and over 43 received their second clinical dose. And as you can see, racially it's disproportionate uh, to the racial ethnicities were not as well represented despite the fact that they were all of these trials were aiming at 15 percent uh, african-american and 15 percent hispanic as well as older adults uh, greater than age 65 and another parameter at greater than 75. all of them were limited to less than 85 they didn't enroll anybody less than 85. also moderna has similar numbers and they were able to recruit more Hispanic people, but not quite as many African-American people. Next slide, please. So in willingness to accept vaccines, it falls on a continuum uh, for any number of reasons, from absolute refusal to people who signed up first, they wanna be in line first, but most people fall on the spectrum between passive ex uh, acceptance. And the question remains if now that vaccines are available, how come so many black and brown people and older people still don't want to receive them? And this is, there's not one answer that answers it all. As previously stated, many of them have already had COVID-19 and they believe that their natural immunity, sort of stoically, I can wait it out and let somebody else who hasn't had any uh, exposure to COVID get the vaccine first, because at least I'm covered for a certain amount of time due to the history of scientific inquiry in black and brown communities, there's of course some mistrust there. And then also just some people refuse to try this particular technology until it's tested out on others. They'll take a wait and see approach and make sure that other people are able to tolerate it safely and then they'll try to get it. But as we see, as difficult as it is to obtain the vaccine at this point, the wait and see, you may be waiting much longer than you initially thought you'd be waiting. Next slide, please. So the key information to try to dissuade people from this vaccine refusal or hesitancy is honest, realistic answers. So we already said it cannot give you COVID-19, that you also may benefit whether or not you had been sick with COVID-19 early on in the pandemic. To stress the point that although it's not 100% effective at preventing COVID, it is nearly 100% of affecting your ability to need hospitalization. And that's an important point because black and brown people, so many of us have been, had our family members affected up until mortality. So if we can convince people that even if you get it, you probably won't end up with a severe case or hospitalized. And the other thing that we have to say is even after you get a vaccine, you cannot run to your local doctor or laboratory and get antibody testing. Vaccines produce a different kind of antibody than is currently commercially available through your local labs. As these vaccines roll out, and it becomes important to know antibody levels, commercial labs will begin to include these tests, but also your medical provider, whoever's ordering these tests would need to know whether or not you had an MRA, RNA vaccine, a vector vaccine such as AstraZeneca, which we're currently trialing, well, they will need to know the type of vaccine that you got. Next slide, please. So now we get to, in terms of hesitation, for vaccination, we see so far the percentage of people vaccinated. So we see that African Americans and Latinos have been disproportionately unvaccinated in regard to their category of availability vaccination. And like I said, it's for a multitude of reasons, but our job is to get out there. And so that's where, as we have scarcity in vaccine, that's where the vaccine trials continue to come in handy and not just for older people or ethnic minorities, for anybody. Young, healthy white people who find that their number will be not be called until July or August or September of this year are equally needed in vaccine trials. Um, the trials that will be coming up, it's not sure what the control group will be now that there are vaccines available. It's likely that you will receive 
one vaccine and one investigation or an investigational vaccine for future vaccines. And also clinical trials, if you're waiting out your time, clinical trials, are, you're often compensated for your time and inconvenience in that trial. And for people to whom uh, a monetary incentive is appealing, a vaccine trial may be appealing for that reason. Next slide, please. So just as before, you can call the New York City Department of Health for command center information regarding questions about vaccines, questions about getting appointments for vaccinations, and also CDC for potential side effects. If you get a vaccine and have side effects, you're also urged, not in a trial, to report those and let future uh, people who are signing up for their turn to get vaccines know what, they, what the potential side effects are so far. Next slide, please. And this is just the slide to show you uh, the scourge that smallpox used to be. And this is a decayed Roosevelt Island Hospital, a former isolation unit for smallpox alone. And it's been so long that the building is completely deteriorated and practically a ruin. So hopefully we can get to the ruin of COVID-19. Next slide. That's the beautiful NYU Manhattan campus. And it's our privilege to do this work. And we hope to partner with you and anybody you may think may be interested in vaccine trials in defeating this pandemic. Next slide, please. While we represent uh, NYU Brooklyn, anybody who would like to participate in any clinical trials should call either of the numbers in Long Island or Brooklyn or Manhattan or scan the QR code that will will attach to this meeting if you're interested in future vaccine trials or even some sort of uh, convalescent plasma, anything or donating uh, blood to research if you already had COVID-19. There are a whole bunch of interesting research going on and, and about to start regarding COVID-19 and we thank you for your time and community board too this evening. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you very much, Laura. That was really great. And uh, bef before I get into anything and I'll ask the committee members for questions, I think I omitted to recognize Ms. Latrell Masso, who is our com uh, a board member who is attending tonight. Latrell, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? I did. I'll do it again. Well, sorry, my mind is, my mind slips, but it's we really appreciate having you here, and so uh, thank you for joining. Um, the uh, trial muscle board members, thanks. Thanks, and we also have Mr. Jordan here, who's part of the executive leadership of the community board. Mr. Jordan, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Hi, hi. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, my name is Linda Jordan, first vice chair, of community board too. Boy, it's great to have you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, but I now like to ask the community, uh, the committee members, members of the Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee, if you have any questions for either of our presenters. And keep in mind, Miss Miss Atlas, I think might have to leave soon. So, um, if anybody who's got a question for Miss Atlas, I would definitely encourage you to to, to raise your hand now. Uh, any anybody from the committee from the committee have any questions? McKnight. Hi, well, I want to start off by thanking the both of you for the presentations. It was very helpful and informative. My question is related to how well does the um, vaccines help with transmission? I noticed that um, you didn't quite go into that. If it will, if we have any idea, if it's 50% chance or, or are we still studying studying that? We're still studying that so we can give an exact number, although I would urge you to remember your basic science. You've never heard of anybody getting a chicken pox vaccine and yet passing it on to somebody else. So science, the science doesn't change, but all of the studies are ongoing, so we don't have definitive numbers. Okay, then I just have one follow up to that. Is that the reason why people are still being told after you get the vaccine that they should still have um, implement preventative measures like um, keeping their distance? 
the reason that they're doing that is number one for public safety. There is a lot of uh, animosity regarding people who wear masks and don't wear masks and you can't necessarily wear a badge that says I've been vaccinated. So you don't want to get into any fights in the street reg regarding those things. And also the day you get a vaccine, you run the risk that you walked into that clinic and were already positive with COVID. So we don't know at what point you are fully protected. It's assumed that about two weeks after the second vaccine, you're at maximal efficacy for both. But still, how will we differentiate walking down the, the street to know whether or not somebody is fully vaccinated or not? Hey, this is Stephanie Sterling. I work with Kelly. Can I add one extra point to that? Sure. Um, I think it's also really important, based on what Laura was presenting, that uh, there's really poor access to vaccination. And so while there's an elite group of us that have vaccination, there's a really massive large part of our population that doesn't. And the vaccine's not 100%. And so 95% efficacy for the two current ones, Pfizer and Moderna, is amazing. But there's 5% chance you could still get COVID. Um, and we need to, think as a community, really try to help prevent anyone from getting um, COVID, especially if there is concern, and there is concern that there might be some strains out there that these vaccines may not be 95% efficacious against. So it's a massive, it's a lot of different factors, most of, um, as Kelly was saying, uh, but we have to still kind of try to help prevent each and every one of us from being able to host the infection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions from members of the committee? Ms. Thurston? Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we, you were just discussing what some of the pushback tends to be. And I'm curious if someone says, oh, I had COVID, so I don't need to get the vaccine. What do you suggest we say to them other than get it for all the reasons of public safety and so forth? But is it inaccurate of someone to think because they had it, they can't get it again necessarily? I guess I'm just curious how you respond to that sort of pushback. And that question's for any any of yeah. the presenters. Hi, this is Lalita. Uh, I can answer that question. Great. Um, so it's believed that uh, you know, once you have COVID, you may have uh, some immunity for the first three months. Okay. So um, the current guidelines uh, for CDC is that you know you can even wait three months, up to three months, to get your COVID vaccine uh, if you've had sort of a natural COVID infection. However, there's a lot of caveats to that. Um, it depends on how severe your first infection was. Was it sort of asymptomatic or did you land up in the hospital with it, you know? And then we don't know what happens with the new strains. Are you really protected if suddenly there's a new strain that pops up in the population? Um, so I think, uh, you know, relying on a prior infection to protect you, especially if you have a vaccine offered, is kind of a risky bet. Um, what I would probably do in that situation, if it were me, is, you know, discuss with my doctor and probably go ahead and take the vaccine if it's offered, um, rather than, you know, depend on an antibody response to protect me. And for all you know, the vaccine may give you that extra little boost that your body needs to protect you really well in case any variant emerges. Yeah, I would also right. say... We saw a lot of this sort of like antibody thinking in September, right around when we first started seeing the numbers go back up again. And we heard from a lot of communities who said, oh, everyone here had the coronavirus in April. We're fine. We don't need masks. Right. We don't need to stop the gathering. And we had to do a lot of work to really sort of reach out to folks and do a lot of education around the sort of antibody myth or the, the mm -hmm. myth of protection. And so I would say the same thing is applicable here. Um, I mean, while certainly if you have recuperated from COVID, you probably have some kind of short term, I don't want to call it immunity, but inability to be reinfected immediately. There is no evidence that you can't be reinfected eventually. Right. Though, In fact, there's plenty of evidence to say that you can be. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. Yep. Um, and then I also think, you know, in, in H &H, on the H&H &H side, we talk about this a lot. 
we see the pretty devastating effects of the long hauler COVID or long term COVID impacts all the time. Mm. And, you know, if you're trying to weigh sort of the pros and cons of like, well, the virus I know versus the vaccine I don't know, I think what Sure, but what we know about the, vac- the the virus is how devastating it can be and how long it can be with you, you know, yeah. even after the point of being infectious or contagious. And so really helpful to keep in mind that, you know, the vaccine can also um, sort of make sure that not just for a short term period of time you're protected, but continue to protect you from the impact. Well, to that end, and and then I think we should move on timing wise, but it would be great, whether it's NYU or this, probably more the city, if we could continue to have more of that public education campaign around this antibody myth that I think, at least in our district, I can't necessarily speak to others. I do continue to hear that. I don't think that people understand the role of antibodies. I mean, a lot of people say it. I hear it very frequently. Like, no, no, no. I have the. An- I'm going to go get an antibody test, then I'll decide if I can go on vacation. And like, that needs to be stopped. And so, if there's anything we can do at the community board to, obviously, we can continue to spread that message. But this is just a general ask for more of a public campaign around that message. I don't think that people have. I don't think it's resonating yet. So I really appreciate that. Can I Thank ask you a all. Uh, sorry, who's 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 asking? Who has the question? I'm sorry. Um, Latrell. Oh, Latrell. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, I don't. If a person takes the vaccine and they take multiple medication, is there any information provided with that? Because usually, like some medications, there's already side effects. So if they take multiple medications already. How would that mix with the vaccine so that the vaccine is really new compared to the other vaccines that's out nowadays? Does that make sense? I... It does make sense, yes. Uh, I think you should think of it as comparable to a flu vaccine in terms of the sicker that you are with comorbidities or other illnesses, the more you probably need a flu vaccine. And also with COVID, if you have chronic conditions, long-term hypertension, diabetes, uh, you probably would have worse outcomes from COVID than somebody that was 30 years old and a marathon runner. So specific interactions, they haven't found any so far, but morbidity and mortality for those people with COVID is probably uh, worse than those that don't need long-term medication. And if I can add to that point, um, when we did the trials, when we were enrolling, we were not excluding individuals because of um, certain medications. We were actually inviting individuals as long as the medications they were on were stable. So they were like immunosuppressants that were um, excluded, but a heart medication or a diabetes medication or the more prevalent uh, conditions or medications that people will take were not excluded and actually invited. So we could get the, um, the data around that. And I don't have a formal number related to concomitant medications and the vaccine. However, we did not see any significant um, adverse event or any significant symptoms from people who were relatively healthy to the participants who were on standard like Lipitor's or just standard diabetes, uh, um, mood, mood medications, um, heart medications. It was pretty standard across the board. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the committee or any other community board members? Mr. Newmark? No, thank you, Brandon. Uh, again, uh, presenters, thank you very much for a very um, informative and, and helpful um, set of presentations. I just wanted to respond to the trail. Um, I have, I received my first shot a couple of weeks ago and um, at the location, which is a medical facility, they asked a lot of questions about um, allergies and other medications that I'm being that are being taken. And so, as long as you go to a reputable place, which I think every place that is allowed to have the vaccines probably is reputable, um, they will go through a screening with you to ensure that it's okay for you to um, get the needle. Thanks. 
I'd also just add to the point, and I'm going to jump off in one second, but at the New York City run and NYU, I think probably has a similar setup uh, vaccine locations, whether they're at H&H or the hubs or uh, the Gotham facilities, everyone goes into observation for 15 minutes after they're vaccinated as well to ensure that if there is any kind of negative reaction, you have a whole bevy of clinical staff around you who can respond to that. And I'll just add that uh, the information about the vaccine say that any serious reaction is going to happen within that first 15 to 20 minutes. So if you're not going to walk out and suddenly drop dead on the street, God forbid. Um, you should be covered. I unfortunately have to jump off, but thank you so much for having us tonight and happy to come back anytime. I just have to hop to my next meeting. That's that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much for your time, Ms. Atlas. For the others, do you think you can stay on a little longer in case members of the public have any questions? Um, yeah, I think we could probably stay another 15 minutes. Would that, would okay. that be okay? Yeah, I, 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 think, yeah. I think that should be sufficient, I, I hope. And I, I, I want to give members of the public an opportunity to ask questions because we encourage this at, at all of our meetings. If you have a question, uh, you can use the raise your hand feature. Um, or I'll try to keep an eye out for people as well, too. And one more thing about the side effects since we're waiting for questions. Um, I know the, the reports of the anaphylactic reaction, which is the most severe form of um, you know, side effect, which is the one where they kind of take you and put you in a hospital and things like that. It's incredibly rare. I think uh, it's in the the latest CDC information said it's uh, five cases per million or 2.8 cases per million. So uh, for about a million people vaccinated, five people will end up having a bad reaction. Um, so it's extremely rare. I think the common side effects such as body aches, you know, uh, joint pain, sort of feeling like you're ill, those things are far more common and most people that I've spoken to have reported them sort of going away in one or two days at the most uh, and respond quite well to, you know, over-the-counter sort of medications. Thank you. The only hand I see raised is from Mr. Andrews, who I believe does not have the ability to speak at the at these meetings because of a technology issue. Um, am I wrong, Mr. Andrews? Or um, so perhaps if, if there's no one else, I, I I actually had a question. I just wanted to give everybody else a chance to ask first. Um, do you have a sense as to how our hospitals are doing here in downtown Brooklyn with vaccinating the hospital workers and? Um, I, I also was wondering about, you know, outreach to communities of color and to what extent you're aware of partnerships with community leaders and, you know, uh, gatherings like Zoom calls like this, except maybe with, you know, people more influential than me um, that, uh, you know, to what extent do you feel like those kind of things are going on in, in our area? Answer some of that. I think um, you know uh, it's interesting. Um, the hospital workers are similar to the general population, so we've had to do uh, quite a bit of uh, education and outreach. And uh, you know, uh, as a whole, I think we're heading probably towards the sixty to seventy percent range, um, and it's been going you know in a phased manner in the hospitals as well. Uh, in terms of educational outreach, there's any number of them actually going on um, across multiple campuses, uh, and I'm sure other hospitals are doing very similar things as NYU. Um, so, for example, uh, today we were speaking to a Red Hook community group as to figure out how best to, you know, answer that group's questions. Uh, there was also more um, outreach going on, um, you know, in the um, Manhattan, uh, different, you know, Harlem community groups, uh, community boards in different areas. So uh, additionally, the Brooklyn hospitals, residents and interns are also taking an active role in providing education to their own communities. 
Um, so I think we're trying to spread the word um, and then individually also, you know, in my clinic, I often ask patients, uh, what are they thinking about COVID vaccines? Uh, and, you know, you get a really good idea of what everyone thinks and what sort of theories are uh, permeating around. And I've been happy to say that over a couple of visits, you know, I've been able to convince a couple of people to uh, have the vaccine. And it helps that, you know, I can tell people that I got the vaccine and I had, you know, these side effects and you should be fine, you know, so that always helps. Um, so we're trying our best uh, to, uh, you know, really encourage people to take this uh, as soon as it becomes available for them. Thanks. Um, unless there are any other questions, I, I think that we, we can thank you all very much for a really insightful and, and, and informative presentation. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely take that forward and, and appreciate your, your, your talk and, and the slides this evening. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll be giving you a round of applause in a silent manner. <laughs> Great. We're happy to uh, come back anytime. Hopefully this is yeah. helpful. I think it definitely was. Thank you. Okay. okay. Great. Well, we're going to move along to the next aspect of our agenda tonight, which is our liquor license review. Um, we have uh, five different liquor licenses that uh, got in the uh, up on the agenda. The first one tonight, new full on premise 33 Lafayette Avenue. Uh, 33 is the name of this location. Do we have someone here from that location. Yes, it's uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, Jim Vincent. Oh, Mr. Vincent, you seem to be having a few audio difficulties. And you're muted, uh, so we can't hear you right now. Um, while Mr. Vincent oh, Mr. is on. Mr. Vincent, I'm sorry. Is it, are you possibly joining the meeting on two different devices? I'm sorry, I had to mute you because the, the feedback was considerable. Mr. Chair. How does that sound? How does that sound? How many? Oh, Mr. Andrews, you've, you've, uh, it's nice to hear you. You've, you. We've got you on the line now. Thank you very much I'm for. How many? Okay. How many? Are we still having an echo? How many? There's a bit of an I, echo, I, Mitch. Oh, maybe that's maybe that was just me. Yeah, it's a little bit better though. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, Mr. Andrews, would you mind going on mute for a, a little bit? So we're going to have the presentation from Mr. Mr. Vincent here. Do we have Mr. Vincent? Are you presenting, or is the board office presenting? Yes, I'm presenting. Okay, great. Do you want to uh, put your presentation up? So what I'm um, going to share today was a little history of how um, the restaurant 33 Lafayette LLC um, came about. And also, we have a unique opportunity for us to receive an upgrade from our current license which is for beer and wine to be upgraded to a full liquor license. So we've been in business for about five years. This is the sixth year. And we've been operating as a 
um, a restaurant tavern with um, a specialty niche for um, event space for the immediate community, um, a lot of birthdays, a lot of art shows, um, shows that happen at the BAM. People will come after and, um, and join us and enjoy our space to celebrate. Um, so that's gone on for about six years. Uh, local uh, residents also patronize our, our place for food and uh, sort of a neighborhood place as well. People come from work. We've established a good rapport with the community over the years. And, um, but our bread and butter uh, was primarily the BAM because we are directly across the street from them. And um, over the last few years, the BAM has started to reduce the number of uh, big shows that they've had. And, um, and we started noticing sales were going down. And um, so we started to look into the reasons why we couldn't um, serve full liquor. And the primary reason was that we were within 200 feet of a uh, place of worship, a learning institution, synagogues, that kind of church. And, um, and then we found out that the, the law can be um, changed and exceptions are made from time to time. So it's been a, a long three years, but I'm um, happy to announce that we have been given a, an exception. And um, the assembly was petitioned. We wrote a letter to the assembly, um, Rodnis Bishat, who patronized um, the uh, part of the Haitian community. Um, I forgot to mention that we are uh, primarily serving Haitian cuisine. And um, so we wrote a letter to her and then she responded positively. And then um, the assembly person, Walter Mosley for, the, for Fort Greene, um, agreed to co-sponsor the bill. And as I mentioned, the bill was turned into a law and we have been granted an exception. So in addition to requesting um, the board's recommendation for sort of a renewal of our license, we are asking for this upgrade so we can um, continue to operate and serve the community and compete in this um, difficult times for small businesses like ours. Um, we've seen a decline in um, patrons coming through, tourists visiting the area. Uh, this was a little bit before COVID. As I mentioned, the BAM was having less shows. Um, we have a great relationship with the BAM, as well as the Polanski theater for um, new audiences. Um, we offer discounts to them um, as well as uh, LY, um, LIU students. So um, we are in a good place and we are requesting this upgrade be recommended for approval. I can um, read, I have in the packet that you guys, um, we submitted the um, community board questionnaire and methods of operations. We also have a menu. We also um, gathered um, a petition for signatures for neighbors. 
and um, and also in your packet there is a a letter from the previous um, manager of the community board, Richard. I'm sorry. Um, Robert, Marbit Paris, that helped uh, when we started the initial request to the legislators. We had to first uh, clear a few hurdles with the community board, of course, to make sure that we're in good standing, uh, which we are. Um, also, we had to speak to um, the Hanson Place um, Seven Day Adventist Church, uh, Pastor Anderson and um, Pastor Richards, and they have no objections. And um, we would uh, just uh, really um, be grateful for this opportunity to change our our business model. We are also going to be launching our new cafe and open during the days. It's called Cafe 33. Uh, we'll have uh, a focus on coffee and lattes and um, we have a great backyard space. We're gonna utilize that more. So the focus is gonna be more on days and lunch and um, and less uh, events and uh, and during the evening business. Okay, Mr. Uh, Vincent, I can answer any questions answer. if anybody has any. Yeah, we can certainly do, we can certainly do that. Um, I I'll take questions from the committee. I, I think there's a few questions that I have off the bat, but Miss Thurston, you seem to want to go first, so I'll be happy to give you the floor. I, I just wanted to understand. You just mentioned this cafe part, Mr. Vincent. Is that <laughs> I want to go on. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, is that reflected in this application? I have the application. You don't need to read through it. Um, but I just want to understand if you're changing your business model or if, if the only change here is just this upgrade to a full license. Mr. Vincent. You are still on mute. Excuse me. So, yes, we are changing the um, our business model to include um, cafe and the focus on takeout now as well. Got it. Okay. Uh, during cool. this uh, pandemic, um, but we are also asking for a um, a recommendation Wait. for. Got it. Upgrade for the new license. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Brandon, you're muted again. Do the hours remain the same? No, sir. The The hours will be increasing to include the days. We are currently in the afternoon to the evening business. So now we're going to open early to capture the the coffee drinkers, people working from home that want to break, want to use Wi-Fi, people on their way to work. So we're going to be open at 7 a.m. to capture the the um, breakfast coffee. Okay. The the backyard. Are the hours changing there at all? And also, 
I noted that on your application, it says 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. on the backyard. So you might need to change that. Are you intending to have 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the backyard? And are those the same hours from the backyard that you had previously? Sir, you're muted. I'm sorry. It, it seems as though that is a an error. We were thinking that you can open for use of the backyard beginning at 9 a.m. for coffee and, like I mentioned, Wi-Fi during the summer months. And then we will we will request that we can stay open if for the backyard until maybe midnight. What is the current hours for the backyard? The current hours is for 11 p.m. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Vincent, you can probably go on mute again for one quick second. I just want to announce a couple of things to the committee. So the board office did receive notification that the, the, the law was passed as Mr. Uh, Mr. Vincent indicated. The alcohol and beverage law requires or prohibits that there be any full liquor license grant for any um, location that is uh, within 200 feet of a, um, for this purpose, a, a school. And in this case, there is a school that is sort of cat a corner of this place. This is located right across the street from uh, BAM there on Lafayette Avenue. And to, I guess, kind of a, a, a diagonal angle, there is a, a, a school that is within 200 feet. And the, um, uh, the school has, has not said that they are in favor or against this, but they they have uh, but they are aware of this. And um, the the fact that this law was passed, it doesn't bind us to vote one way or the other with respect to this application. But it's it's being provided for your information as background. So um, with that said, Mr. Vincent has uh, has stated that the. The outdoor area is going to be open until mid midnight. He, he's like to he's like to ask us for midnight for closing the outdoor area. The indoor area is proposed to close at 1 a.m. on Thursday to Saturday and 11 p.m. on Sunday through Wednesday. And to really kind of describe what kind of a place we've got here, this is a, a building. It's on. Uh, it, Lafayette Avenue looks like the cross street is St. Felix. It's about a three or four story, about a four story building. And the, the location is on the, uh, the, the first floor here. And there are some upper level residents and, and some neighboring residents in the, in the location nearby. And I, I do know there's about 15, 20 signatures that was provided with the application. Um, some, some of them, a few of them are people who are actually in the same building as, uh, Mr. Vincent, um, is coming from. So with that, are there any questions from members of the committee? And, and, uh, I want to welcome Ms. Acaso Cobb to our, our meeting tonight. Um, Ms. Cobb, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Or I'm You are still on mute. Yeah, we cannot hear you. There you, you go. You're me? off mute now. Yeah, you we can me? hear you. Yeah. Okay. My name is Akosua Cobb. I'm a board member, and I apologize, but I'm having difficulty getting on. Oh, Thank sorry you. to hear, but that's not out of the ordinary, and definitely feel your pain. Um, nice to have you, Akosua. Um, any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Vincent and his application? Uh, oh, we have Mr. Harrison here this evening. Mr. Harrison, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? And if you have a question, feel free to raise your question. 
Sure, Mr. Chair. John Harrison, member of the committee, former chair, former vice chair. And I have to apologize profusely. I purposely left my city job early at just past five. Having just arrived here about 15 minutes ago, I too had problems getting on. I signed in and it kicked me out. I signed in and kicked me out. I signed in and kicked me out. And just like a social worker, Acosta, I tried again and eventually. Um, I do have a question for the applicant. Since you said, Mr. Chair, that the, I believe I heard you say that the applicant raised the issue of the new light, the new law, or perhaps he did not, but you, you outlined the new law, but I'm sort of confused. And before I ask the, the applicant, the question, you said that this law is passed, but it seems that the way you then present it, it's not binding to the applications. Is that true? No, what it, what it mean, what I meant by that statement, John, is that the it, it's binding in the sense that the law does not prohibit um, Mr. Vincent from uh, from obtaining a full liquor license. What it's not binding upon is it's not it doesn't require our community board committee to vote one way or the other on this application. We view this the same way that it, we would view any other application based upon whatever thoughts or questions that we might have, as would members well, of the community. That's all I meant right. to say. So did right. you have a question you wanted to raise? I did, but before I raise the question, I still don't fully understand. You said there's this new 200 foot rule from a school, right? Does that, does that I mean, mean it's that- It's just that this is, we're allowed to upgrade this license even though it's within 200 feet of a school. That doesn't mean we have to upgrade the license. That's all. All right, so I thank you for the clarification. I guess it's my dunderheadedness, but I'm, I'm not fully understanding, but I don't wanna labor on that. So my question, having come in late to the applicant, um, is whether or not the um, portion of the affected residences, either above the establishment or adjacent to it, have weighed in on this application on the petition. Significant being more than 10 or 12. That's my question. Hi, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yes. I think if, if if but the question is if i heard correctly is it more than 10 or 12 people residing above us or adjacent to you mm-hmm. no there, there are two uh, uh there's one property next adjacent at 35 lafayette and there have uh, three apartments above a, a dog um, grooming business. And then our building, there's another three apartments above. To the left of that would be an empty lot. So if you go further left, yeah, you see the art gallery, yeah, the mural. Yeah, that's to the left. So it's under 10 people if you're asking on the two adjacent sides. There are two empty lots. So out of those people, Mr. Vincent, how many did you speak to and and did anyone raise any concerns? Thank you, Mr. No, no, no concerns because we've We've been there since 2015. So um, the business is going to operate essentially the same with a few changes. We are actually going to do less evening um, um, with the new license and, and, um, and opening up during the days for coffee and um, lattes and uh, breakfast and lunch. Currently, we're not open for breakfast and lunch. So we've been getting um, patrons that are visiting have been asking us for years, why can't you have some of our traditional 
um, uh, drinks like cremas and, and liquor. And um, people will come from all the way from Connecticut and New Jersey. And the answer has always been, well, we can't get the full license. And, but now we, we, we've um, crossed that uh, hurdle. And um, so we're all optimistic, but the business is, um, again, we have been in the community for quite some time and we have good uh, relationships with our neighbors, uh, business as well. Well, thank you for that. Mr. Newmark, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vincent, uh, I just want to clarify. Um, you're currently using that backyard till 11 p.m., if I understand correctly, and you're hoping to um, keep it open till midnight. Um, while at the same time, you're saying that you're going to be cutting back on evening business and doing more of a morning and daytime. So my I, my questions kind of relate to the issue of I'm not thrilled with something being open till midnight during the week. Um, if there are any people who have to actually work, whether it's at home or or outside the home, if there are any children. Um, so my hope is that you're willing to reconsider that. Um, and, and keep it at the 11 p.m. time that you've been functioning at. Um, so, um, as such a good community member, as you described. Am I? Okay. Well, we will always you can, you can respect respond the to, Mr. Uh, recommendations of the board, and um, I will accept. Whatever time you guys um, recommend, I I just point to um, over the years we have again had a good track record, and then um, specifically the last couple of years. Um, so okay. it's it's we would like to be open and use of the backyard, especially during these um, um, difficult times. But the board's recommendation will be um, followed and respected. Okay, I, I just thought we'd ask. <laughs> I appreciate that, Mr. Vincent. We'll we'll have some time at at the conclusion of the questions to discuss our our recommendations. Um, any other questions from members of the committee or the board? I, I just wanted to point out that uh, what was said before about the um, Mr. Vincent, the, you just hold on for one second. They did indicate that they are. Sorry about that, Mr. Vincent. Um, I appreciate that you have have some additional thoughts here. I, I, I just want to ask if any other members of the committee had a question for you. Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Vincent, I have a question for you. It's not so germane to your um, to your application, which appears to be a good one, but it's sort of it's sort of germane to my voting. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but do you have a relative, Vincent, who is currently working for the New York City Department of Social Services? I'm sorry, I didn't. You broke up a little bit at the end there. You said something about social services? Yes. Do you have a relative who is currently uh, employed by the <laughs> social service? What? No, not to my knowledge. Then I don't have to recruit them. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harrison. Any questions from members of the community for this application? All right, I'm not seeing any questions from the members of the community for this application. So at this point, I'll ask the committee if there's a motion. Mr. Harrison? I'll Move second. To approve. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. I heard a second from Ms. Thurston. Okay, discussion on the, rec the motion. Um, we have a, 
is there anyone who has a point they want to raise and discuss and keeping in mind um, we might want to uh, address what we feel is the recommended outdoor hours you know 11 or 12. I know what Barry's point of view on the subject is. Do we, does anyone else have any thoughts about it? I'm fine with the 12 o'clock time. I have to. John, do you have any thoughts? You're the one who made the motion. Yes, Mr. Chair, I do. In fact, the, um, the applicant has already testified that he's operated for some time. He, he, by his by his testimony, he 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 seems to be well liked by both the businesses and the residents. And in this COVID environment, where businesses are having a horrible time struggling just to survive, I personally I don't recommend that we impose any on the time. Okay, Mr. Newmark, do you feel how do you feel strongly about your position in this regard? Um. Can you, first of all, I'm unmuted, right? You are okay. unmuted, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, do I feel strongly about it? Um, in light of uh, my colleagues' um, opinions, I certainly um, will accede to their perspective and I will vote to approve the motion. Oh, oh okay. Stand. Okay. Well, the were there any other comments? Have, yep. Oh, the go ahead. Go ahead, Barry. Said, is uh and and probably it's not necessary but mr vincent um please in case there are any complaints that surface which heretofore have not because of that um later time opening um please i hope you will be responsive and respectful um and try to make sure that people aren't uncomfortable i will thank you Thank you, Mr. Vincent. All right, we'll take a vote on this matter now. Um, I, I vote in favor. Um, Ms. Thurston? I'm in favor. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mark? Yes, in favor. Ms. Cobb? Uh, uh, yes, Ms. Cobb? I'm sorry, you were, you were muted. You're muted, uh, Akaswa. You want to give us a thumbs up? That would be good. Yes. Oh, great. We got you. Ms. McKnight? Yes. Okay. Mr. Andrews? All right. Well, um, yes. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair. Great. It's unanimous. Um, thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Vincent. Um, we can move on to the next application. Next on our agenda tonight, we've got 159 Bridge Park Drive. Do we have anyone here from that location? Hi, my name is Ian Graham. I'm from Brooklyn Sill. Hey, do you have your presentation to give to us? Yes, I do. Great. All right. Um, okay. I'm just loading up the document. Um, can everyone see the, the paper document I just loaded? No. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, thank you all for being with me tonight. Um, my name is Ian Graham. I run a business called Brooklyn Sale, which operates out of the marina in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, I've done it for three full years. I'm the sole owner and operator. Um, and I'm applying for a liquor license. It is a 34 foot sailboat. Um, and I only allow groups of six or less. Um, the hours are not changing. It's from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And um, in years past, I've had people BYOB. Uh, trips are about two and a half hours. Uh, people can add an extra hour, but generally speaking, they're two and a half hour sales for groups of six or less. Um, so people have been able to drink in the past. We take the boat out from the marina. We go over all the safety instructions, et cetera. 
Um, and then we do a tour around Governor's Island. We see uh, the Statue of Liberty, the Harbor, the World Trade Center, the Brooklyn Bridge, and then I bring everyone back. Um, nothing's changed. I am the only boat doing this in Brooklyn. So I think it's great to give everyone access. Um, I charge a lower price point than the other operations in, Brook uh, in the New Jersey, Manhattan, Brooklyn area. Um, people can go out for an individual spot for as low as $64 for two and a half hours, which I think is a great value. Um, and they can see the entire harbor. I have a 4.96 out of five star average rating with over 600 reviews. Um, I've sent um, this notice out to the surrounding um, uh, Dumbo BID, the Fulton Ferry Neighborhood Association, uh, the Brooklyn Heights Association, and the, um, also some of the uh, nearby residential buildings. I've cleared it with the marina um, and I'm, um, Within 500 feet, barely, I haven't measured it, but it's quite a ways away into the marina, but there is a restaurant that is closed now. Um, uh, estuary, which is run by the marina, but they're aware that I'm applying for a liquor license. And um, if you have any other um, questions or information that you'd like for me, uh, my website is bksale.com, um, where you can see the boat, Generally, everyone wears masks. Um, if it's a private group, they don't have to wear masks because we're outside and seated separately. I always, as the captain and operator, do wear a mask. Um, and yeah, that's I, hopefully that covers everything. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Voting this and looking at your hours, it seems that it this is going to be from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. Um, with that, are there any uh, committee members with any questions? Community board members. Mr. Harrison. Mr. Chair, thank you. Sir, are there any government bodies or certifying or accrediting um, authorities over in New York Harbor for which you have to get approval for either the sale, the, the dispensation or distribution, or the consumption of liquor? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, not that I'm aware of. I think the license itself, um, which is a special permit for a liquor license for a vessel, um, allows that. I have all the necessary credentials, uh, including a captain's license, um, and that clears me with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, registration, which clears me with the state of New York, um, CPR certified, and um, so. And I have a TWIC card, which is a transportation worker identification card. So I have all the necessary, um, and as well as insurance, um, things that are needed. Right. I I can appreciate that, Mr. Graham. Because yeah. I don't know, I just wanted to. Neither the Coast Guard nor perhaps. And I wouldn't know what any other governing body for a sailboat in New York Harbor is, but that you don't have to also, I don't know, whether it's check in or get some kind of approval from those entities. I'm, I'm almost certain that the liquor license covers vessels if it the one that I'm applying for and that there's no necessary additional anything. Um, I've already, like I said, operated for three years with a BYOB and that's been um, totally fine and okay. I've had I've conversations with the Coast Guard who see me out there every day and uh, everything's good uh, from their standpoint, okay. as far as I know. Can I, can I just pop in for a second, Mr. Chair? Sure. Um, so we, we are the licensing board for um, the water taxis and there is nothing ex additional that is required of Mr. Graham on this application. Um, the fact that it's coming to us is because the, the boat is docked in our waters. Uh, so we just go ahead and treat this just as we did the previous license and as we will treat the one that's coming. Um, 
Thank you, Ms. Church. Any other questions from members of the committee? Any questions from members of the public for this application? Okay. Not seeing any. Um, could I ask if, if anyone has a motion? Motion. Motion from Ms. McKnight. Any second? Second. Second, Mr. Newmark. Discussion on the motion. Any anything we want to discuss? <clears throat> Not hearing anything. Um, I vote in favor. Person. In favor. Uh, Ms. Cobb. Ms. Cobb is in favor. Um, yep. Ms. McKnight. Yes. I'm in favor. Uh, I believe that was Mr. Andrews who said he is in favor. Yes. Um, in favor, yes. Mr. Newmark. In favor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harrison. Yes. Uh, did I miss anybody, Jessica? I don't think so. Okay. I got everybody. Great. All right. The motion passes. Thank you very much, Mr. Graham. Appreciate seeing you again. Okay. Thank you all for your time and um, check out Brooklyn Sale online and hope you all can uh, come out for a sale sometime. Yeah. Congrats. Great. Um, thank you very much. The next one on our list tonight is 922 Fulton Street, Brooklyn Borough. 922 Fulton Street, anyone here from that location? I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I can hear. I can hear someone who, who who's speaking. I'm sorry. Uh, Pepe, Pepe Urquijo, Jose. Oh, oh, Mr. Urquijo. Yeah, I see your. I see. I see. Uh, I, I I see your your box, but I don't see you. But it's okay. Are you able to present the the, the your paperwork? Uh, yes, I presented my paperwork to um to Carol Ann. And I uh, have been chatting with uh, somebody, um, and they said that they're passing it along. So my packet is together and uh, ready to share. Or I can upload it. Well, if you're able to share it, then that's one thing. But the board office would otherwise have to share it. So can we know if anyone who's taking the lead on this here? So you can send me the pineapple, thanks. Okay. Any other fruit I can send? Okay. Mr. Um, Okio, yeah, here we go. Yeah. We're gonna start presenting this now. Um, you wanna go into your, your application? Sure. Um, hello? everybody that can hear me and see me um, i opened up a taco shop about uh, four and a half years ago we're gonna turn five this year and if i would have known uh how how, uh, how many? the challenge the challenges there Thank is you. in uh, getting your beer and wine license and then coming back to get your liquor license i would have done it all back then i've learned a lot a great deal and um, the number one question that we are asked um, on a, I would say a weekly, a monthly basis is, can I get a margarita? And if you're selling Mexican food anywhere in the world, I think uh, uh, a good number of people are gonna assume that you also have margaritas on hand. And unfortunately, um, things haven't gotten any easier for a small business on Fulton Street, but uh, to see people walk away and and you know I'm a at the sun. There's enough sun to shine on everybody. I always send them down the street to Sochil or um, to other bars I know in the neighborhood. And uh, now I'm here before you because uh, I I I. 
would think that getting an upgrade and being able to offer uh, margaritas or a beer and a shot and um, just what customers are asking for isn't a bad idea. And uh, we're a close-knit uh, block there, the 900 block of Fulton Street, and we don't go past 10. Um, nobody's out on the street past nine, um, really, in, in our neck of the woods. So we just want to offer folks that are moving new to the neighborhood or just coming through, they want to get something to drink with uh, with their food and uh, make it really simple. We, uh, we're open in the morning, but we're not trying to, you know, do mimosas or anything crazy like that. We would start selling those types of drinks at 12 and, uh, and then cut it off at, at 9 p.m. Um, although I do see <laughs> it says 12 a.m. there. Uh, that's really interesting because we close at 9. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're not looking to, to, stay, to stay open late. That's okay. my opening statement. Um, is okay. there any questions or I'm here to ask, answer any questions or um, have a conversation with anybody. I wish you all could see me because I'm wearing a really nice hat. We, but, we, can, um, we can see you. We can see oh, you. you can see me. At, yeah, we can see you at, at okay. points. You come and go. You come and go, which is which is which is OK. But a couple of things to confirm, which are definitely pertinent, and and for for some of the the, the folks here, and maybe for all of us, one, you don't have any outdoor seating, do you? We have a a patio. We have a patio. Um, we've we've always had a patio, um, and uh, we're the only we're the only business actually on our block that actually has a functioning patio. Uh, all the other businesses uh, don't take advantage of their. Uh, their backyard space or as much as we would like to do. Uh, and we obviously also have a, um, uh, the permit to uh, have tables in the front. We have a small space, so there's only two tables. Um, okay, so what, what yeah. are the hours for the backyard? Because they're not on the application mm -hmm. and we would need to get a copy of that to the board office with the hours for the backyard, whatever they are. Okay, yeah, the, the backyard closes at 9, 9 p.m. Uh, we don't go past that. Uh, we usually start to close it up. Uh, if maybe there's a Friday or Saturday, we'll go till 10, but never, never past that. It's a, um, it's a pretty quiet neighborhood. Have there been any concerns expressed from neighbors or I know your your place is on sort of a mixed use block where there may be some upstairs neighbors in your building. Have there been any concerns? No, no. In fact, uh, those were uh, some of the folks that first signed off on our um, on our application and we have uh, we have great neighbors. They they know our story, uh, what we're doing and um, they're in support of of keeping uh, keeping great burritos in the neighborhood uh, alive and well, and uh, this is only going to help us keep the lights on. Okay. Questions from members of the committee, Mr. Harrison. Oh yes, this is going to be a Mr. good Harrison. one. Mr. Harrison, you're on mute. So whatever you're saying, we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, a lot you're of people have been trying to do that for me for years, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. I'll, un right. I'll unmute myself. So I, I did listen to the presentation. I had to do something in the kitchen, but I was listening attentively. I didn't hear what the cross streets were. Okay. Uh, we, we are on Fulton in between Washington and St. James. Okay, got you. So I, I know the block quite well. So um, listen, I wish you all the best. And I only have one more question, Jose. Okay. Can I get a margarita? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, any other questions from members of the committee? Mr. 
Mark. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Mr. Huio, I would just suggest yes. that um, if you think that we're going to be open till 10 o'clock, occasionally on a Friday or a Saturday, that you put that in the application. So this way you're covered in case okay. it is okay. open and somebody can't complain that, you know, what are you doing? You're supposed to only be open till March. Okay, uh, I'm I, I apologize that that's not uh, clear inside of uh, the application, but I will take care of that. Well, Mr. Arquillo, what what would be your what would be your requested hour? Are you are you requesting to close at at ten o'clock on in the on the outside on Friday and Saturday, or are you requesting uh, some other time? Because right now, oh. I understood before Mr. Newmark's comment that you're. You're 9 p.m. every day, but if you want to do 10 p.m. on Friday, Saturday, then that that would be, I guess, maybe what he was suggesting. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Friday, Saturday. Yes, I'm going to take care of that so that it's in clear uh, in clear print, so that there isn't any. I, I thought that was already done, but I didn't. I didn't dot my eyes and cross my teeth, so I apologize uh, for that, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Aquio. Mr. Mr. V Mr. Andrews, you you got a question um, you wanted to raise? Question: Do you, are you doing? Are you do you have any accessible bathrooms in your uh, establishment? How many? Uh, yes, there are bathrooms. There. Oh, I have one bathroom. Is the bathroom accessible, to folks with a wheelchair or or to people who are need to comply with this uh, Americans with Disability Act? Yeah. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from either the committee or the community? Any members of the public have a question on this application? All right, I've got no more questions. Any any motions from the members of the committee? Move to approve, Mr. Chair. Motion, Mr. Harrison. Can I get a second? Second from Ms. Cobb. Uh, any discussion on the motion? I'm in favor. Okay, um, I, hearing no other discussion other than Mr. Andrews is in favor. Um, Mr. Newmark, how do you vote? He's in favor. Um, Ms. Cobb, how do you vote? Um, Mr. Harrison, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, Mr. Harrison's in favor. Ms. Thurston? Yes. Um, Ms. McKnight? Yes. Great. Um, I vote in favor as well, too. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Aquilio. Thank you. All right. Um, moving along to the next application, we've got 333 Atlantic Avenue, uh, the Atlantic. <clears throat> Anybody here from that location? <clears throat> yes, good evening. My name is Patrick Watson. Hi, Patrick. Um, how are you? Well, we're delighted. Would you like to put up your uh, application? Well, we tried to troubleshoot this beforehand, but I'm unable to share my content, so I forwarded it along to Carol Ann in hopes that she'd be able to put that up for me. Okay. okay. Mr. Rich, have you had success with that? Perhaps you can get it started a bit by telling us a bit about your, your, yes. your place, Mr. Watson. So 333 Atlantic Avenue is in between Smith Street and Hoyt Street. Um, we are applying for a full liquor license to open a bar restaurant with live music. Um, my wife and I, since 2004 have owned and operated businesses up and along Smith Street and Court Street. We still own um, Smith and Vine, which is a wine shop that's been around for a very long time. Um, we have had until COVID, unfortunately, a cheese shop called Stinky Brooklyn, which, yeah, kills me. Um, but we, after 15 years, had to shut that down. We had a bar restaurant called the Jake Walk for a solid 10 year lease and um, had excellent uh, reputation with 
Department of Consumer Affairs, we had a sidewalk cafe. Liquor license was always in great um, shape with the community, never any violations or issues. Uh, in about 2009, I opened and operated and created all of the operations for Brooklyn Wine Exchange, another wine shop on next door to Trader Joe's. In about 2015, our partners uh, wanted to buy us out and kind of take the business in a different direction. Um, and so we've been owning and, and operating businesses and trying to um, do things with great taste. And our concept for what we're calling the Atlantic is modeled much after um, <clears throat> maybe Joe's Pub, if you've heard of Joe's Pub. Um, um, you know, we, you know, maybe City Winery. I mean, this is a much smaller space, but we, it's a room that is really designed towards lighter style music. I'm not saying there won't be some rock and roll, but it's going to be a room that's much more designed for jazz. We plan on having blues every Sunday night with local musicians. As you know, this neighborhood, you know how many musicians are in this neighborhood. And we want to have guest appearances from many of them on a blues, Sunday blues night every Sunday. We do want to host a couple of fun live band karaoke ideas from musical theater to maybe a Bowie night um, where we uh, can, can put together some really good programming. Um, I'm hoping, yeah, if, if you could, that's great. My wife and I, before 2004, and this is to give you a very brief, uh, we were uh, bar managers, sommeliers, um, restaurant captains in three and four star restaurants. We opened Blue Hill restaurant here in the city. I was the uh, opening, uh, one of the opening sommeliers at Lupa. I've been at Gotham Bar and Grill. We had a, a very long, extensive career. Uh, next slide, if you mind, please. Thank you. I, I know I want to keep it uh, brief. Um, so these are just what I noted here in the neighborhood. And, you know, we, we've had a long engagement with the schools in the neighborhood, the community and parents. Um, nonprofits across Brooklyn. We've always, I think, had a, a maintained a very good relationship for being very involved. Um, these are just some accolades and reviews. I thought that would be fun for the New York Times to CBS. Um, Smith and Vine has been rated in the top 10 wine shops in New York City for a number of years, which has been great. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is, I mean, Marty Markowitz was a huge supporter of my wife and I. Um, I was a, a wine writer for food. Um, I'm sorry, for Fine Cooking Magazine for a number of years. And so I just wanted to kind of put those up there. Marty was always a very big and still is um, supporter of entrepreneurialism and us and my wife and I. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, just a couple more. You know, again, our concept, Sunday Blues, um, having a house band, um, many, many jazz sets. That's what this room is. It's not a music hall of Williamsburg room. It's not that big. Um, Brooklyn Music Factory, my kids go to. They're in the Gowanus, and they would love a space to be able to showcase the children. Um, this is our, this is the building. No, that's great. You can, you can keep, keep on moving forward, I guess. I mean, I can come back to any of these uh, as well for any questions. Um, that's just our location there. And the next slide. Um, and so again, the room is really, you know, this is a, a bar that we purchased from Neiman Marcus who went out of business. It's super tasteful, including the shelving and the mirror, just to kind of give you an idea as to what the, the taste is going to be in the room. Um, I don't want to say it's not going to be upscale by any means. It's going to be very tasteful. Um, next slide, if, if I may. Um, and this is the space as it is now. I know it's hard to look at. I'm sure you're sick of looking at uh, unfinished spaces. You can see that we purchased. The very first thing that we did was from the Brooklyn Music School. Um, gave us their Yamaha Studio um, Grand Piano, which to me is critical and going to be a, a very important fixture uh, in this space. Um, but you can see up in the top there, there's a little bit of a balcony. There's an upstairs and a little bit of and a downstairs. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a 
it's a, a pretty amazing space. You can definitely rest assured we are soundproofing it. Um, we're creating a foyer in the in the front entrance so that no sound will spill out onto the street. We're not collecting, uh, selling tickets at the door. This is not that kind of establishment. Um, we are going to definitely have security personnel on any night um, that we certainly feel we need to be a little bit more careful. I think on the blues nights and the nights that are more driven towards the neighborhood with jazz, we're still gonna have security there, of course, um, but I, I, like I said, I, I just want you to be assured that we're going to take it very serious. My wife and I have extensive history with liquor licenses, making sure that underage people are never served, um, especially people that are already intoxicated. And so we uh, definitely want to make sure that, that we are, are, are very, uh, very sensitive to that and the community, which we are a big part of in the neighborhood. Um, uh, and so our reputation certainly is is very important to make sure that we uh, we 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 only produce establishments of value. Um, the next slide I think might be just our menu, just to give you kind of an idea. You know, we want to use sahadis and have a big mezza plate. Um, we want to bring back our stinky Brooklyn five cheese mac that was in and published in the Brooklyn um, Magazine cookbook. Wines by the Glass, a really fun selection of sparkling wine from Champagne to kind of pet nats or, um, you know, in, in that kind of world, things that are just celebratory. We at the Jake Walk had a very um, well-renowned cocktail and whiskey program, and that's just what we know best to do it right. And, um, you know, I, um, and I believe that is the last slide and at the risk of being uh, a going on for too long. I'd, I'd love any questions. And there are a couple um, questions I have right off the bat, Mr. Watson, and sorry, just to make it clear for everybody. First of all, could you speak to the degree of accessibility of your your location in terms of, you know, folks with wheelchair or disabilities? How, how, how accessible absolutely. is it? Second, does it have any outdoor space? And third, what kind of interaction has there been with the surrounding community and any nearby residences? Because I know this is on like a rather commercial block on Atlantic Avenue, but there may be some upstairs residents or some nearby residents in the adjoining buildings. I've in passing uh, only been able to connect with a few of the residents via the coffee shop right there. Um, and I've had some pretty great, very, very welcoming um you know, uh, remarks about this as an idea to bring to the neighborhood. There is no outdoor space. And we have an ADA accessible bathroom on both floors, as well as an elevator um, that, that, I mean, they did a great job on building the space out, um, making it completely compliant, of course, but there is an elevator and um, two ADA bathrooms, one upstairs and one downstairs. Great. Um, one thing that one of our committee members who isn't here tonight would want us to raise is to how many people do you plan to hire and to what extent do you plan to hire locally from here in, in our in our local neighborhood, particularly, you know, communities of color is a, is an interest that our community has, although it has no bearing on our, your application. Exactly. No, I mean, I appreciate the question, I think, for and we learned this during the, the pandemic. Um, we had to, because the subways were so bad for so long, really focus on hiring only people that could walk or bike ride to the stores. Um, and so, you know, we we certainly don't look at location as a requirement to hire somebody, but it's always great when it's close by for so many reasons, um, whether it be to pick up a shift that somebody called in sick or can help out in, in a pinch, anything in that kind of world. So it is something that I'm very sensitive when I do interview people, if they're coming from New Jersey or somewhere like that, it's it's always a question that um, that, is, that, is, that is very important for me to make sure that it's not gonna become too out of their way. But hiring from the direct 10 square block vicinity has always been something we have tried to do. Harder to do with minimum wage jobs maybe, um, even at Stinky, we started people at 15 an hour, you know, eight years ago. And 
you know, it was very rare that we wouldn't pay someone around 19 or $20 an hour who was just a, a counter person, but, you know, or somebody helping customers. But, you know, I think um, having people close by is, is critical. And in fact, a lot of the musicians that we're going to give a stage to are, are very much focused on this neighborhood. And, and as many of you probably know, five musicians that live in the neighborhood already just by uh, just by your own your own networks. But, you know, we, we definitely are and always have been um, focused on where we live, knowing it best and, and doing, again, tasteful establishments for the neighborhood. OK, thank you. Um, any questions from members of the committee? Mr. Harrison? You're on mute, Mr. Harrison. Still on mute. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Um, Patrick, I, I did listen to your presentation. I'm sure you probably said it, but again, I didn't pick it up. What are the cross streets on Atlantic? No problem. It's between Smith and Hoyt, a little bit closer to Hoyt. Um, yeah, it's it's across from French Louis and down maybe seven more buildings, six more buildings. Okay, because um, I, I'm going to um, say something which um, the chair has already has already touched on, um, and it's not a requirement, but you are um, you are presenting before the Health, Environment, and Social Service Committee. So in, in um, deference to and in the absence of our great colleague, uh, Alejandro, uh, when it comes to the social justice of hiring, you have, you have also, um, I guess the word would be testified, Patrick, to the fact that you think it's good to hire locally for a whole lot of reasons from a business sense. Um, in relation to your cross streets, you are almost within a stone's throw, if, if you're any good at baseball, um, of both um, Wyckoff and um, Gowanus projects. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to um, negate the need for hiring of uh, Ingersoll or, um, or Farragut. But um, I am not speaking for the committee now. I'm speaking from um, my professional stance as a social worker working for the Department of Social Services, in deference to the fact that it is that you have um, succeeded with your wife in business and have put a lot into the neighborhood. And from just my perception of what you said, um, it's, it's from my perception, it's been a class act all along. But you also seem to have um, a social bent to you uh, as a, as a as a longtime um, officer of the New York City Department of Social Services, whatever it was being called, HRA, DHS at one time, um, I, was, I was a component of, and now it's combined. Um, I strongly recommend that you um, continue and perhaps enhance, burnish that, that record by, um, by considering uh, hiring from um, the locations I have named and others that are pockets of poverty that are also, besides businesses suffering, suffering in this uh, in this COVID environment. And if you would consider that, I thank you so verily. Uh, without a doubt, um, without a doubt, you know, um, I think this type of establishment will lend itself to so many different walks in our neighborhood and give jobs to so many different people. You know, I think I was limited at a place like Stinky because I really needed people who focused only on cheese as a, as a, um, you know, a career path, you know, um, and at Smith and Vine, I mean, we've, we've, we've got, you know, uh, people who live in the neighborhood, people who come from a little ways, but they represent every ethnic, you know, to me, that's always been, you know, obviously, you know, I mean, it's it's easy to say that, but I mean, it's never been something that I, 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 I've I ever deterred away from. And uh, I would be help beyond happy to get the word out when we're ready to open this place and garnish that support and get those those community members to come and apply and talk about it. Um, 
and, 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 to, and to definitely focus on the neighborhood first when giving these jobs. Uh, Mr. Smith as well, I wanted to, you had asked how many jobs. I mean, this is a small business like any, but I think we're gonna probably hopefully have around 15 people working there um, as much as the, the, the revenue will allow, right? Uh, but 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 that's probably my guess is between 15, 10 and 15, hopefully more than 15 would be ideal. That means that the business is doing well. Okay, that's great. And I appreciate your perspective on that, Mr. Mr. Watson. Just so you know, we, we typically recommend folks to check out the, and I don't know the extent they're available in COVID times because th things have been a little different in COVID times, but um, Ingersoll Community Center, Brooklyn Navy Yard, and mm -hmm. Fort Green Snap, are the are the, are three great locations, and you know again it has no bearing on your application, but but we we are very big on hiring locally and feel like you know we got to acknowledge the fact that we have you know uh, a lot of disparities that exist even within our own district locally. So um, you know encourage people to do their part, and you know that that's about all we can do. Um, folks on our committee, any other questions from Mr. Watson, Mr. Newmark? Apologize for the late hour, but um, and I apologize if all of this was clear. I don't recall seeing the application, so that's why I have a couple of questions. Um, could you clarify for me? Is uh, three 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 Atlantic going to be simply a venue facility? It's it's more a bar with you know a restaurant. We're going to have a full menu. Oh, okay. um, the staging aspect is is. Um, you know, it, it's not a venue first, you know, we're not going to be playing in the, in the grand world of those types of establishments. Our goal is really to focus on having a lot of, again, jazz and blues and folk, um, you know, you know, stand up, maybe even comedy nights, obviously tasteful, um, open mic nights that the neighborhood can, can get together and utilize. You know, I don't want to say that we're not going to have bands in there. We're going to have bands in there, um, but we're going to have more of an emphasis on food and wine and culture than, uh, you know, um, those types of venues where people are just abusive to the community when they leave and generally very drunk. I've been to those shows, of course, but it is not in, in, in our fashion to create that by any means. Okay. Um, so, um, how many how many uh, people will your um, venue be able to accommodate at any one time? I mean, the architects tell me around two hundred, but I think that's insane. Um, and that's with standing room. We're really going to have about eighty seats. It's, it is a big space, um, and I think it, it would be wonderful to to be able to do some private events in some regard. You know, when it comes to maybe weddings or things in the, you know, in in that kind of um, facet. But yeah, it, it's it sounds like a lot to even me, um, and we're prepared to manage that without a doubt. I think my wife and I, after all these businesses over the years, have seen ourselves being able to graduate to something maybe a little bit bigger, um, but with our only know how to to kind of back that up. Okay. And my last question, and again, I appreciate your responsiveness. Um, in terms of soundproofing, I heard what you said. You're kind of focused on making sure sound's not going to come out into the street. It looks like it's a residential building that you're going to be the ground floor of. Um, That's correct. So I assume you're taking pains for ground for a loud, oh. um, for soundproofing to be relevant in terms of the building. And Without I know a doubt. that can be very tricky. Uh, any one of us who lives in a multifamily dwelling knows sound can travel in very strange ways, just like water sure. can travel in very strange ways. So can you can you say something about the attention that you and your Absolutely. staff are, are paying to that issue? And, and in fact, sound and water is like a brilliant analogy because it is. It leaks in places that you don't expect. Right. You know, the idea with soundproofing is to create a room within a room. We're hiring a local company, um, Brooklyn Soundproofing and Insulation, who, if you look them up, has amazing reviews as a contractor to soundproofing um, spaces. And so we're starting there. Um, you know, as if opening a small business, 
I mean, I remember we opened Smith and Vine. You could open a small business with 80 or 90 grand in the city. Nowadays, that's just impossible, right? So if you could imagine the quote we got is well over $150,000 just to soundproof the upstairs. Yeah. Uh, and so we are, are very fortunate that, that we're going to be able to do it right and that we right. have the money to do that. Thank you very much. Appreciate your responsiveness. Thank you, Mr. Noor. And thank you, Brandon. Any other questions? No, no worries. Any other questions from members of the committee? Mr. Harrison? Yes, Mr. Chair. Patrick, I have another suggestion. It's from another hat of mine. Um, as a graduate of Pratt Institute and um, a, a longtime resident of the area, um, there are, and I'm sure you know this as a longtime business member, but there are um, a cornucopia of creative artists, both um, visual and um, performing and literary. And um, since you, since I think um, our, my, my colleagues have asked the right questions and, and through your testimony, you made mention of the fact that the, that the architects told you the venue can have up to 200 people. I could see um, a future in which um, you would liaise and um, try to, um, I guess one word would be to tap into the cultural resources of the community um, to the benefit of the community and to the benefit of your, and I could see where this would really enhance your business. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are regarding um, just a whole host of things that, that you could um, foster in your uh, upcoming business. It's a great question. I mean, we have so many amazing friends now um, being in the neighborhood for so long, since 1997. And some of them are graphic artists or cartoonists for the New York Magazine. Um, and they do um, big elaborate projection drawings during performances. And they live right here in the neighborhood. In fact, the gentleman who did our logo lives in the neighborhood. Um, again, I, I, there is a surplus of talent in, in our neighborhood when it comes to musicians. Uh, I sang opera for many years. If you Google my name, you see that I did the, the anthem at Barclays Center and um, Fenway Park. I mean, music has just been in my blood as well as wine for so many years, right? Just uh, being in the industry. And my wife would, did you know off-Broadway performances and it was in a band for many years. My kids are performers. There's just no way around it. But regardless, getting back to your question, um, I, I plan to tap into every aspect that the neighborhood can give us from murals to, you know, obviously graphic art to visual art to performance art as we get this, this place off the ground. Um, sure. That sounds great because I think you have a lot there between Ingersoll Community Center um, brick, bam, definitely. Brand. Um, there, to everything from like classical venue to slam poetry mm -hmm. to jazz to Absolutely. um to sculpture. I just it it's almost downtown. It's almost endless, it, and I just think it would be a, a wonderful thing for your business, and I think it would be a wonderful thing for the community if you and your wife might consider. Uh, a kind of a more expansive than a less expansive way to sort of um, showcase what's really uh, the cornucopia of talent and um, on various mediums that are ever present in the arts, both visual, performing, um, musical. Um, yeah, that would be really great. I can't tell yeah. you how excited I am to even get At this point, I'm sorry, Mr. Watson, I, I don't want to cut you off. I really just want to see if there's anyone else who has questions because we, we've, we've asked quite a number of questions and we're post 8 p.m. right now. Is there anyone else from the committee or from the community who has a question for Mr. Watson? All right. Not seeing anything um, at this um, I want to ask if any of the members of the committee have a motion for this application. 
Yes, Mr. Chair, I move to second. approve. Second. Okay. Uh, we got a second. I'm going to give this one to Victor because I haven't given him a second before. Um, any discussion on the motion? Discussion? Uh, All right. How does everybody vote? Mr. Harrison, how do you vote? Mr. Andrews? All right. So I'm unsuccessful at getting Mr. Harrison or Mr. Andrews so far. Ms. Cobb? Yes, Mr. Chair. I was I was muted. Okay. I got Ms. Cobb and Mr. Harrison. Yes. Um, Thurston? Yes. yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yes, Mr. Andrews. Ms. McKnight? Yes. Hey, Mr. Newmark? Yes. Okay. I vote yes. Um, the else for the I missed. I don't think I missed anybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. Greatly appreciated. Welcome to the community and, and I hope Thank you have you guys. successes. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Good luck, Patrick. Thank you. We all have to go for a sale and then finish with some blues. <laughs> there you go. Thank you yes. guys. All right. Well, the next and last new on premise application tonight is 39 Clifton Place Guvara's. I, I see we, we have Miss Guvara here, which I'm going to guess is the right person. Um, yes. Do you want to, uh, uh, are you able to present or do we need the board office to do that? The same as Patrick. We tried to troubleshoot it and it didn't work. Okay. So I emailed it to uh, Carolyn Church. Okay. That's fine. Do you want to go ahead with your presentation? And I, I assume the board office will present the application. Yeah. Um, do you want me to wait for it to go on screen or just, just start? No, talking? if you just start going, we're, we're at a bit of a okay. late hour. So it'd be great yeah, to yeah, start no, hearing I, more I, about your application. I understand. So for the last uh, almost six years now, I've been the owner and operator of Mecklenburg's. Um, which is thankfully still alive and operating. Uh, back in June of this year, a neighboring business shut down due to COVID. Um, they, their name was Urban Vintage. I don't know if you know them. Um, friendly with the landlord, uh, he came to me offering me this space. I thought I was opening a pop-up, Givaras, which is my name. Um, which was going to be a vegan Cuban style coffee counter uh, that was selling plants. And that's what we were going to be until our, uh, uh, until our off premise license came through for a wine liquor shop. And in these last, we opened, construction took about three months. We opened in, the end of October, so October, November, December, whatever, in the last four months, five months, if we closed this place, there would be riots. So we had to sort of reevaluate. I have released, obviously, the off-premise wine liquor uh, application and applied for in on-premise, and Guevara's is very much here to stay. Um, we are, like I said, a very, uh, I'm half Cuban, half Sicilian. So this is a uh, Cuban styled menu, uh, much of which is my abuela's recipes that we just turned vegan. Um, I think vegan is a growing trend. I became vegan at the start of the pandemic, just to, I think have some sense of control over something. Um, and it's really, it's really taken off. It's been, it's been such a joy and a pleasure. Um, also, I feel that since I operate a place just down the street, also with a wine, beer and liquor license, I'm able to, in this iteration, offer where Mecklenburg's falls short. Uh, Mecklenburg's is pricey. Um, it's elitist. It's, uh, it's not for everyone. At Gavadas, it's we don't sell anything that's over ten dollars. You can get two empanadas and a coffee, a large drip coffee, for six dollars. Tell me where you can get that. Uh, Starbucks down the street is is more expensive. Um, 
I have a very strong focus in hiring. I know diversity has been uh, a big part of the conversation. Uh, like I said, half Afro-Cuban, half Sicilian. I look like my mother. Um, but I've always had a very, very, very strong uh, position on hiring, uh, on, on running my companies. The, the rue of my companies is anti-racist, anti-ableist, anti-sexist, pro-immigrant, pro-trans, queer, LGBTI plus, just we are a very, very inclusive company. I wanna say 80% of my managers are women and women of color. Uh, we are consistently inspired by the authenticity and diversity and local entrepreneurial spirit that just lives in Brooklyn. Uh, we have a very clear company culture, very thoughtful hiring processes. We were talking about hiring locally. That is always on the forefront. Uh, we have very consistent training programs. I, oh, I, I'm aware that I'm in the service industry. Don't come to me and stay for life. And I'm very proud of the fact that wherever they go on to, they go on to bigger and better because what we've taught them. Uh, we really strive to exemplify an environment that reflects diversity and rich diversity. Um, in terms of the benefits, I, I'm a large employer. I have over 100 employees under my umbrella. Um, I don't, and I operate, I wanna say better than, than most from training to mentorships to benefits, um, PTO, if it, the second you come on, if you're a full-time worker, you get 40 hours of paid time off. Uh, after three years, your PTO increases to 80 hours. After five years, your PTO increases to 100 hours. Um, I have people that have been with me for five, six years. They get 100 hours of vacation every year. Uh, bereavement, not bereavement, but paternity. Um, Paternity and maternity in this country, I think, is terrible. <laughs> uh, but um, paternity, we've had a couple of our workers take paternity leave. One is actually coming back uh, on Monday, Elon. The city only pays uh, paternity leave at 60%. We fund the additional 40% and an additional month. Uh, the same thing on maternity. Uh, medical, dental, you're with me for one to two years, we pay 50%. Three to five years, we pay 75%. After five years, we pay 100%. Again, those people that are at 100 hours of PTO, now they're also getting free health, dental, vision. Um, so just to speak to me as in, an employer, I'm happy to go into the menu and stuff like this, but I think right now in this climate with just so many people out of work, I think it's very important to do your due diligence on who these people are that are opening uh, businesses right now and making sure that they're gonna do right by the people that are investing in them. And I just wanna make it clear where, where my mission stands there. Um, what um, was the business? I don't, I don't what know was the presentation. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, what was the business previously? Was this the Urban Vintage place? It was or? Urban Vintage. Yeah, okay, Emily and yeah. Errol. Yeah, so Emily, who's lovely. I mean, I saw her every day. She made me a cappuccino and I always got the almond horn cookie. Um, heartbroken to see them leave. They had just signed a new lease, but she was pregnant and getting ready to have a baby. And I think it was her opportunity to just bounce and go to the suburbs. And she did. Okay. And I don't, yeah. So you're 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. That That's what the license says. But it says there's an outdoor space. What would that be? And what kind of conversations have you had with, with residents? And if you can throw in there whether you have an accessible bathroom or ADA accessibility, that would be great, too. Sure, yeah. So um, it, right now we're operating 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, with this liquor license, we will be going to 10 p.m. because we will be able to uh, offer a dinner uh, menu. Uh, unfortunately, once you hit 6 p.m., people want to drink. People want a glass of wine. They want a, a daiquiri. They're, right? They want they they want something to drink. So it's in order to extend the hours. That would happen once, hopefully, the liquor license comes through. Um, 
outdoor space would mirror would mirror what um, what what's on the application of 10 p.m. Uh, I have spoken to a huge a huge amount of people in the community that are upset that we're closing at 6 p.m. That are don't have you know wine beer frozen daiquiris. I mean, the, much the same way the burrito guy said, uh, you know, how do, how do you have burritos without margaritas? How, how are you Cuban and you don't have daiquiris? So uh, it is a, um, a co-op, I believe. Right? I've spoken to the owners of the co-op from um, the, a couple of them, and they, they, they have given their staunch support um, from Carl to Joe, my landlord, to Nina, they, they, they've all been very, very plus. Excellent, thanks. On the accessible bathroom, do you plan to have an ADA accessible bathroom? We do. There is a step to get up on the entrance on Clifton, but on the entrance on Grand, there is a ramp, so you can enter that way, and the bathroom is ADA accessible. Okay, great. Um, how many people do you intend to hire? Uh, well, we're already operating. Uh, we're operating at about 10 employees, but with the extension okay. of the hours, this would bring us from 10 employees, I would say between 15, huh? 16. 15, 16. Victor, um, sorry, you may need to mute. Um, I don't know. Thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? Mr. Harrison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Alicia, what what are the cross streets on Clifton? It's it's really grand between Clifton and Lafayette. It, it's okay. the corner of Grand and Clifton. Okay, and the chair asked you about um, you know uh, how do your neighbors feel? Or you or you said it without him asking. Did I didn't catch it? But did you? I know we're in COVID, and so it's difficult. But did you have any um, petitions that were signed? We followed on the second page. It was pretty clear that it was being suspended by the community right. board. Okay. So okay. I, I followed that, but I, again, I operate another business just across the street. So I'm talking to the community constantly. I live on the other side of Guevara's. So. Okay. It, so you I, live, you, you live within two blocks. I live within two buildings. Got you. So what oh. you're, what you're testifying here to is that um, there's, it's a generalization, but there's generally support for this establishment in your neighbors, uh, whether they're two doors away or two blocks away. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? Any other questions from members of the public for this application? All right, um, hearing none, can I entertain a motion from the, commit, uh, the committee? Move to approve. Uh, motion from Mr. Harrison, second from Mr. Newmark. Um, give me a quick second. Uh, our secretary has had to depart us for the evening, so I'm going to be taking the minutes the rest of the way. Um, all right, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, vote in favor. Mr. Harrison, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Cobb? Yes, yes for Mr. Andrews. Yes for Ms. Cobb. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't hear who just voted. Who just voted? Um, Mr. Knight, how do you vote? You vote in favor. Mr. Newmark? Yes. Okay. Great. And um, Ms. Thurston told me prior to leaving that she voted in favor also. So thank you very much for your presentation. Good luck. And thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck, Alyssa. Thank you. Just give me a quick second, everybody, because I'm doing double duty. Um, okay.
So we're down to renewals for the evening. And um, up on the renewals tonight, uh, for everybody's awareness, we've got 445 Gold Street, DeKalb Stage, 336 State Street, The Grand Army, 197 Adelphi, Plat Amata, Plata Amata, uh, 62 Henry Street, Henry Street Ale House, 84 Court Street, Queen Mary, uh, 189 Bridge Street, Amarici, 38 or 38 Henry Street, Noodle Pudding, 184 DeKalb Avenue, Miss Ada, 82 Clark Street, Yuhao, and 10 Claremont Avenue, Oaxaca Navy Yard. LLC. Ms. Church, have there been any concerns expressed by members of the community for any of these renewal applications? Not since they were last renewed, no. There's been nothing. Even without the qualification. I that's right. The lawyer in me was going to ask about that. You've got so <laughs> there. There hasn't been. There haven't been any concerns even before the the last application. There, there was some when um, one eighty nine bridge initially opened. Um, that How long resolved ago was itself. That? Uh, maybe five, six years ago. All right. Um, can I get a motion from? Anyone in the committee? Move to approve. Mr. Harrison moves to approve. Second. Okay. Yeah, before we do discussion, I forgot to ask whether there are any members of the community who had any concerns or to express. So I, I'd like to give the members of the community an opportunity to do that. See, Mr. Venicom has got his hand raised. So, Mr. Venicom, the floor is yours. Uh, we Vinicom, cannot hear you, Mr. Vinicom. Bill, you got on mute, Bill. Okay, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. I'm sorry. Um, so we had we had a uh, a very nice uh, a little uh, block party in Trinity Park August of last year. Uh, we, it was mostly for children in the neighborhood, for people to get to know each other, do some networking. And Marici came out and uh, set up a, uh, set up a table, help us with that event, provide some food. I just wanted to uh, say if they were a uh, they were a good neighbor to Bridge Plaza. Okay. That... I've got that in the notes. Um... Remind me who's the second on our motion. Ms. Cobb, okay, thank you. I accurately record that. Um, Mr. Venicom, one, it's always a pleasure to see you at these meetings. And secondly, um, do you, I, I thank you very much for uh, commenting. Um, were there any other members of the public who had any comments for this, for any of the renewal applications that I mentioned? There were none. Thank you. Okay, so back to our motion for a second here. Um, was there any discussion from members of the committee on the motion? Hearing none, um, I vote in favor. Mr. Harrison, how do you vote? I vote in favor, Mr. Chair, and in so doing, I just want to say it's wonderful to see Bill. Um, Ms. McKnight? Yes. Uh, Ms. Cobb? Yes. Mr. Newmark? Yes. Mr. Andrews? Mr. Andrews? Oh, 
Okay. I'm not hearing Mr. Andrews. Um, I get you, Mr. Newmark. Okay, I did. He's in favor. All right. I think we are all in favor of this one. Um, so let's go down to the next item on the agenda tonight. This is the response to budget priorities. Given the late hour of the evening, um, I and the ability that we have now ahead of time to pick this up in our next meeting, uh, I'm going to suggest that we we take this offline for the next month. We'll have a, a Google Doc that we can work on, and we'll pick this up in our March meeting uh, on the the district needs and budget priorities. Moving along to the next item on the agenda. Approval of the minutes from January 6, 2020. Um, has everybody had an opportunity to look at the minutes from January 6 of 2020? And does anyone want to raise a motion about the minutes from January 2020? I'll move to uh, approve the minutes. A second. Okay. Uh, we got a motion from Barry, second from John. All right. Any other any thoughts or corrections or 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 issues with the the minutes? There is a. I, I just want to note there was an item in my chair's report which didn't make it into the minutes the last time, but I'll email Ms. Thurston about that. I had I had mentioned that, um, and this will be a good reminder because I think my chair report will come up next, and I'll have to mention this again that the. The the uh, the there, we have an idea for a potential project as a um, committee where Miss um, Mazo had suggested we engage one of our prior presenters, the doctor who came to present on uh, childhood asthma, to partner with District 13 and 15 and and uh, work out a a way for the uh, the doctor to uh, provide services to those different educational communities and. Um, it would require a partnership from the with the uh, Youth Education Cultural Affairs Committee, and I'm, I was planning to speak with uh, Ms. Feibush about that a little bit later in the in the week. But it, I, if anybody on the on the uh, uh, committee has any thoughts about that, let's pick that up in other business. Just want to mention that I raised that at the last meeting in my chair report. So minutes with that addition, um, I vote in favor. Mr. Newmark, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Mr. Harrison. Yes. Uh, Ms. McKnight. Yes. Uh, Ms. Andrews. I see you're unmuting Chair, yourself. I voted, Mr. Chair, I voted for both for the other last uh, renewal. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay, and do you vote for the minutes from January 6th as well? Maybe call me. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. That should be everybody. Um, so we can move along to the next item on the agenda. Chairperson's report. There are a couple of things that I wanted to say, but Given the late hour and, you know, I, I really hope we're going to have a little bit of a swifter meeting the next month. I, I'm going to uh, defer my chair comments to the next month. So hopefully we have more of the committee uh, there at that point. Um, yeah, that, that's that's what I'm going to do. Um, all right. We're at other business. Uh, there was one item I want to raise on other business, which is that. You all have seen that I've circulated an email and we've all had an opportunity to participate in a discussion about certain items of guidance that would not necessarily require us to um, vote a certain way, but would just give us an eye that, the, that these are potential factors that would uh, 
maybe encourage us to look a, a bit deeper into certain applications. These are objective criteria. And I, I've sent it around to everybody, but I'm just going to list out what we have because I want to see if there's any further discussion about it and uh, hopefully take a vote. Um, and again, like this will not bind us to do anything with respect to these applications except pay more attention to them because I think the, the, the goal is to try to make sure that we are, um, are, are, are looking at each of these applications um, you know, fairly, but, but also paying attention to the factors that we've seen before where community members have raised concerns or there, there are significant issues that come up after the application gets approved. So the list consists currently of number one, private parties, uh, facilities that are offering private parties. Number two, uh, generally speaking, hotel licenses. Um, number three, uh, 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. indoor closing times. Uh, number four, residential locations nearby. Number five, outdoor seating, particularly rooftops and backyards directly abutting residences. Um, number six, uh, facilities that are offering DJs or live music. Um, number seven, particularly large occupancies, venues that, that have about 100 seats or more, um, or they're really, they have a lot of seats compared with the number, uh, with the size of the location as it appears to be presented. Um, next, uh, prior history of complaints at the location or regarding the applicant. Um, then the next one, if there's any community concerns that are expressed. And then finally, with Alejandro's suggestion, brand new buildings where perhaps we don't fully know the impact of what they're going to bring to the community. So I think with that, um, I would make a motion that we consider these, these items, our, our guidance for uh, future licenses that we hear in our committee. And I would ask if anyone has a second, then we can have some discussion. I have a second. second. Mr. Okay, Mr. Harrison gets this as he's going. He, he went first. Is there any discussion on the on the motion? Yes, on the motion, Mr. Chair. I have a friendly amendment to the chair whose motion it is. I know I did not participate in any fashion or form in adding to the discussion by email, for which I apologize. But I didn't have ideas then. But I have two, which may already be covered by what we have. But there is a mention of the number of seats. I think you mentioned the number 100, Brandon. I would yeah, only suggest from, that... from, from a rough perspective. You know, I, I don't see anything anything definitively here. It's it's right. really just approximate. Right, and I get that. But I have a suggestion of, uh, and it, it's covered already by that concept, because these are, in my eyes, these are concepts, right, guiding points. But I think right. that maybe based, based partially on the testimony by Patrick Watson at, at tonight's meeting that the architects told him that his um, soon to be opening, I guess, establishment could hold up to 200 people. I'm reminded of the fact that sometimes we get venues where the seating might be 50 or whatever, some number le less than 100. And yet the occupancy, I guess, according to the Billings Department, the fire department could exceed 100. So we might want to say something besides just of the number of seats, but also the occupancy, just as a thought. So I don't know whether you want to or not, and you know, I'd go with whatever you thought. The other thing I'm thinking, and again, I apologize if it's implied, but I didn't hear it mentioned in the um, email discussion, nor did I hear it mentioned in your good recap, of uh, a sort of a red flag going off for um, a history of issues with former establishments. And again, I'm reminded of that by Patrick Watson's testimony because apparently he and his wife, amongst the cornucopia of businesses they had, some sold liquor, right? And it seems like, from what he said, that there are really no problems with his, which is good, which is what you want. But we have had uh, applicants come before us who um, they're trying to, you know, do what they're trying to do. And um, it comes out some that one or two of their prior establishments, there were issues. So we may or may not want to include that. 
All right. Well, we've got that one in there. It's history of complaints oh, with, the, with the establishment or the applicant. And I accept your friendly amendment with respect to um, considering the. Uh, I remembered I accepted it. Now I can't remember what your friendly amendment was. Occupancy. Oh, occupancy. Occupancy. Number, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I just, uh, okay. Any any other any other comments from the committee? Okay. Hearing none. Then before we vote, I just want to go over it one more time, just so that everybody understands. So the idea here is to adopt some guiding principles as to objective criteria that we can look to upon focusing our attention more as a committee on, on different liquor license establishments. The principles consist of ap applicants who are offering private parties, any hotel licenses, a 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. indoor closing time, the proximity to local residences, um, at any outdoor seating, particularly rooftops and backyards that directly abut residences, any place that's open for DJs or live music, large occupancies or um, seating capacities, uh, whether it be in sheer number or compared with the physical size of the space, a prior history of complaints at the location or for the applicant, um, community concerns being expressed, as well as any new building where there isn't a history yet of, uh, of, any, of anything, it's a completely new building. So those are the, those, that's, that's what's on the table as the guidance. Um, and from here, we can take a vote. So yeah, obviously I made the motion, I vote in favor, but um, Mr. Newmark, how do you vote? Yes, I accept it. Ms. Cobb? Yeah. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ms. McKnight? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Andrews? You got me, Brandon? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I got you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for your uh, your your support of that, and um, we have agreed to to have have guidance that that is not binding upon us, but will be, I think, pretty helpful for um, focusing our attention on the applications that matter the most. Um, Church, I'd be happy to recognize just, you. Sure. Thank you for just for a quick second. I want to respond to Mr. Harrison's comment about occupancy. So so. And I'm sure you know, as a past graduate of Pratt, that there's sort of like two levels of occupancy, right? There's the the the, the person occupancy, what the building can safely hold or the space can safely hold, and then there's the seated occupancy. And if you take a look at our questionnaire, it does ask that that be separated. Sometimes people don't; they just give the uh, full occupancy of um, the, the the restaurant occupancy and they don't give the FDNY number and we should remember that they are definitely two different numbers. Thank you, Ms. Church. That's exactly why I raised the issue to the chair. Thank you both. Um, was there any other new business that anybody would like to raise tonight from uh, members of the committee or the board? Um, just one, Mr. Chair, if I could. Okay. As far as difficult as we find ourselves in with what we've gone through as a, as a community and as a city, as a state and a nation, and I know you know what that's referring to. Um, again, I can only say that um, it's a new day and um, hope is on the way. So I think we should do our best to try to keep a positive outlook because it really, it it helps so much uh, in these um, difficult and dire times to try to keep a, uh, just keep looking at the prize and keep keep a hopeful off face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Any other new business that anybody would like to raise tonight? I'm not hearing any. Um, 
At this point, the next item on the agenda is the community forum. Does any member of the public wish to make a statement at community forum tonight? You're welcome to do so. I'd like to just thank you for your great work. Oh, thank you, Mr. Venicom. I'd also like to, to say you. thank you to everyone for uh, taking the time for this meeting and application. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, any other folks who have any comments for community forum? I'll, I'll be entertaining a motion to adjourn shortly thereafter. Okay. Um, not hearing any at this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Harrison. So moved, Mr. Chair. Okay, have a second. Mr. Newmark. Oh, you know what? I'm going to give Ms. McKnight the second because Ms. McKnight hasn't had a second in a, in a while and I want to I want to recognize her. Sorry, Mr. Newmark. Um, the. Any discussion? Not hearing any. Um, I'm in favor. Mr. Newmark, are you in favor? McKnight, are you in favor? Ms. Cobb, are you in favor? Mr. Harrison, are you in favor? Yes, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Andrews, are you in favor? Okay. Yeah, going to pass. Chair, yeah. Okay, I was going to say the motion is going to pass whether you you said anything or not, but it's it's nice to know that you're in favor. Um, okay, well, thank you all very much for coming out to the meeting tonight. It was a great pleasure and. Um, I will aim to will aim to be a little bit quicker next month. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You I think you did a, a great nice job. Evening. It was a great meeting.